evening. Thank you very much, Stephen, for your kind words and for inviting me here. Um, this is not going to be an academic uh, lecture. Um, I work, as Stephen just pointed out, in a museum which is uh, talking about the war in Flanders, more particularly in West Flanders, from Newport to the French border at Armentières, the, the most northern bit of the Western Front. And uh, uh, what we do there is tell the military history, but also try and go in depth for all of the people who were involved in that uh, First World War in that area. And that is a great number of people. Um, they came from as many, in today's terms, as 60 different uh, nations. And uh, in all, uh, almost 600,000 people uh, died there. So, so it is a, an important battlefield. Uh, important part of the Western Front and I hope uh, to explain to you tonight that it's also an important part of the Irish involvement um, in the Great War. Um, I have uh, a good personal reason uh, to um, have this particular interest in Ireland. Uh, this is a photo uh, taken by my father in the early 1960s. When I went uh, for the first time to the lonely grave of William Redmond in Loker, I was born and we lived for a very long time in Renningels, which is uh, not even four kilometers from that uh, grave site. And so um, I, I was not even 10 year, years old when I heard, first heard about uh, Ireland and the fact that also in the First World War there were Irish troops involved um, in that war. The, the site, some of you may have seen it recently, looks quite different now. The, the big hazelnut trees uh, are, are uh, no longer there. Um, but uh, as Stephen pointed out, uh, I'm, for more than 20 years I've been involved uh, with the Inflammable Fields Museum. And in its collection we also have that and then all of a sudden my, my childhood memory and my professional interest uh, uh, coincided. This is a, a copy of Ireland Memorials records um, of which there's about a hundred copies and I have been told uh, far fewer even in, in a wooden cabinet like that presented uh, like that. And of course as, as many of you, you will uh, know uh, it was um, Sir John French who uh, actually um, uh, ordered it or asked or instigated uh, the, the compilation of this uh, important uh, uh, Roll of Honor. And uh, as you know, uh, he was uh, the first uh, commander on the Western Front, and that was at the time of the First and Second Battle of Hebrew, and consequently he was uh, made uh, Sir John French uh, uh, of Ypres and that's how he signed ever since. So that is quite intriguing uh, that a person uh, just spells his name after the town where uh, I live. And uh, so that was the, the professional connection. Um, it's on display in uh, the Flanders Fields Museum. And uh, we felt that closed up, uh, it, it's a beautiful object, but you cannot do a lot with it. So, so we, we felt that it was necessary that we could uh, at least try and open it up digitally. And when we started doing that, it's just when we started doing that, and when we were having requests from people visiting to ask, uh, find a detail, that the work for uh, the memorial records uh, really started. Um, there, there are uh, a number of reasons why you need to look in uh, uh, closer at that. At the time when, when it, it, it was compiled, of course, it was an incredible, uh, important undertaking to do, and it was also very difficult, so that there were any mistakes in it. 
that's that's not surprising. Um, um, also, maybe just say how beautifully illustrated it is, and and it's one of the the most beautiful roles of honors that there are about, uh, and there are many. Uh, uh, produced after uh, the Great War, but this is of uh, a particular uh, quality. Uh, this, coincidentally, is the page with uh, William Redmond uh, there. So the guy of uh, the lonely great and loker was also in the book, so another uh, intriguing thing. And um, so, uh, 49,435 Irish names, and, and we try to open them, not just for our Irish uh, uh, visitors, uh, but also for quite uh, a good number of uh, uh, people coming from uh, the England or Scotland or Wales, who were uh, at some point serving with an Irish regiment, and so had a particular interest um, in the names. And around the same time, since we not only have uh, uh, visitors from uh, the UK or Ireland, uh, absolutely not, there are a great uh, number of, of uh, I would say, uh, in general, if you look at, at on average, 215,000 visitors per year, we have uh, some 52% come from abroad, so from outside of Belgium. And from that group, the, the largest group is in some way uh, linked with the former Commonwealth. And that's quite normal because throughout the war, Ypres was one of uh, the sectors in the front that uh, was held by the British Expeditionary Force. So there is that immediate connection. Um, to say more of our visitors, one in five visitors to this day, a hundred years on, is still in a way directly connected to the history of the war. They come because they have to visit a relative uh, who died uh, in the war. One in five, even a hundred years later. So that's, that is, there is an important connection. Uh, but there are of course also French, Belgian, German, um, and, and many other nationalities. Last year we had visitors from 75 different countries in the world. And so we, we felt, uh, because when people visit the museum, they also then afterwards uh, come in our research center, um, which is not an archive, which is a documentation center, but which of course has archival documents, uh, many personal stories, a lot of uh, those brought in by the relatives who come and visit. And so it, it is important that we can help all of our visitors to have particular questions. And, and, and the most typical question is, we have a relative uh, who was fighting and dying in Flanders, but we don't know a lot about it. Could you help us? So we have in our research center historians who are familiar with the military history and can help people on a very individual basis. In return, we very often get uh, that very individual stories from a family perspective, which makes it all the more interesting. And so we set up a plan in 2003, that's what we did, we started doing is to say we look at all the fatalities who fell uh, on Belgian soil during the First World War and uh, we try and bring them together in an inclusive list. This is a list uh, with all nationalities, so former friends and former foe uh, alike but also for both military and civilian. And in Belgium that was a very important thing to do because uh, until that point uh, nobody had ever made a central list of civilian casualties. Um, that was not what you did. You honored the military debt and not uh, the collateral damage which was considerable uh, already in the First World War we have in that list now over 20,000, it says there, it's already more than 22,000 uh, uh, at today. 
So um, we uh, have included uh, the research into the Ireland Memorial Records um, uh, into uh, that research. And what kind of research we have to do there, well, I go uh, in, into that uh, in a minute, but just pointing out that at the moment, this is an ongoing project where we have each year four students who spend the time with us, three weeks, we try and, and, and tell them they are history students, and they uh, spend three weeks with us, uh, uh, not so much because they are historians, so they have uh, uh, the, 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 the training, the right uh, methodology for uh, that work, but they also have the local knowledge, the local background. Stephen was explaining me about uh, the, important, uh, the importance here of, of uh, townlands, uh, a concept completely unknown to Belgians. Uh, I mean, if we, if we know as, as much as, as all of the counties of Ireland, well, then, then you have someone who's interested already. So if you want to find out what the background is of all these people, uh, then you really need uh, uh, people from uh, the country itself. And on the other hand, it's important for them, who are not necessarily military historians, uh, that they know uh, what, what happened uh, with all the Irish uh, troops involved in the fighting in Belgium. And that is something we can provide. If you set us together for three weeks, then we can do some work. And that is what's happening now. Uh, one of the byproducts, Stephen already mentioned it, it's here in this magnificent, the entrance of this magnificent building. I was uh, very happy to see it uh, like that. Uh, so just the records for the uh, casualties and I should say the, the, the fatalities of Ireland and the United Kingdom are over 174,000 and Val Carmen had this great idea of saying let's bring it to the people of the United Kingdom and Ireland and let's uh, show it to them, that's presented to them. Because this is a connection that even a century on is still important, as is uh, proven in our daily work every single day. And uh, with that, already over a thousand stories have been added on the blank pages uh, in the book. So that's, that's a, a byproduct. Another thing that we do with that list is that uh, during uh, the centenary years, <coughs> we project on exactly the day, uh, uh, one century later, uh, of the, the death of someone, we project their names uh, on two uh, uh, spaces in the uh, museum. And uh, uh, I must say, the uh, reaction by the public, from the public uh, uh, to that, is, is overwhelming. Uh, you see people come, and visit the museum at that point, cameras in hand, and waiting until uh, the name appears. Uh, on uh, the 1st of June, it's going to be OK. On the 7th of June, it's going to be impossible. And on the 31st of July, or the 16th of August, even more so. Um, there's uh, one day that we didn't, uh, uh, we were not open long enough to have them all passing through. That was the 22nd of August 19, uh, 2014, uh, which was the battle uh, of the borders, um, of which uh, the Battle of Mons was a very tiny little uh, side uh, show, as they call it, but in the the, the French and, and German armies fighting on the French-Belgian border, uh, over 30,000 people died, uh, of whom more than 20,000 on Belgian territory. So uh, we couldn't uh, project them all on that uh, day. Um, so what what are we are we trying to do there? Well, you try to understand them and you try to make them better, which is. And, and uh, with all respect for the work that happened, uh, but, but 
And for instance, uh, apart from a few exceptions, everybody who died on the Western Front died in France. Well, uh, that is not so, uh, and some of you in the audience today know that that isn't uh, right. Uh, uh, there is uh, uh, some more detail uh, possible there. Um, but also you could say, who is in the memorial records and who is left out? And why is that so? So you can start correct. What we can do is correct the theater of war, uh, correct the, the place or the places of commemoration, because already we see that happening now, that people tell us, well, they are not only commemorated in the cemetery or on the missing memorial, they are here in Belgium, but also back home. And they send us photographs of the war memorials, etc. Et so it's again a connecting thing, uh, and therefore very important. Um, we also felt that if it's uh, concerning all people from Ireland, well, let's try and make an effort to make that better than what is included already in the memorial records. Uh, there are a number of unknown or leftover or uh, people that are not uh, for one reason or another included uh, in the memorial records. Uh, why is it important? Well, um, uh, commemoration is very much a one-to-one -one thing. You will not be interested if you come in our research center and you ask somebody about your relative and we don't have the answer. We only have the answer to um, your relative's neighbor. That's no good. So we have to have everyone. That's, that's the first thing. But also, as we learned, we started in 2003 doing this and little by little we saw a pattern emerge. In military history, there's always talk about casualties. Well, casualties is a, is, a, is, a, is a very broad and wide concept and used in many different ways. Fatalities is something completely different. If you, if you count the dead at the end of the day, you get a sense of the sacrifice that was required on the actual day. If you know it from both sides, then you get an understanding of what was really happening in, in, at that moment. And we, are, we haven't finished yet, but little by little we see that historical understanding is also helped through uh, that work. And then of course, as we all know, in uh, Messine there is since 1998 the Island of Ireland Peace Park, where uh, copies as a register are, is a copy uh, held of Ireland's memorial records. And maybe uh, in, in the far end, uh, whenever we, we think we, we finish the work, uh, then maybe there should also go uh, a copy of the corrected uh, uh, records uh, in there. Um, which is, of course, a very important uh, factor in uh, the reconciliation uh, process, uh, which is... Uh, uh, blessing us all, not just the people in Ireland, but also the people everywhere in, in Europe uh, for the last uh, 20 years. And uh, so that's, that's why we think we do it. And we will end up in the end, I guess, also with, with some completely new names that even are not in the Commonwealth War Graves uh, records um, and, and uh, that are in addition uh, of people that uh, nobody knows of. But that is uh, well before where we are at this moment. So, in our list of names, out of the more than 550,000 names of people who died in Belgium during the First World War, 12,950 uh, from the memorial records uh, uh, are uh, listed. And if you uh, see to what armies they belong, that is, and of course it, that seems quite, quite logical. Already I can tell you that, uh, of course, that the majority uh, is fighting within the British Army, that is uh, quite clear. Um, but, for instance, last year we had an exhibition about the Canadian Expeditionary Force, and we have 15,119 
Canadians who died in Belgium. Well, out of those, we know from the Canadian records that 583 uh, at least, there will be more, there was a, a, a great number of out of those 15,000 that we don't have uh, the origins from now at the moment, but at least 583 that we know of were born in Ireland. When you look at the memorial records, only 180, um, and 68 per feature. So there is a difference there. We are at the moment, we have also Australian students uh, working for us. Officially, there's only 53 uh, who, were, uh, who are in the memorial records and are in the Australian Imperial Forces. Well, we are already over 100. And, uh, still counting, and so on and so on. So, what we haven't looked at at all, which we will do for next year, because as you know, uh, the United States enter in 1917 in the war, but it is not before Christmas that we have any troops, American troops, uh, at the front, and in Belgium it's only in the spring of 1918 that they are first deployed. Yes, but from then on we will also look what the origins of uh, these uh, soldiers is. There's also a lot of uh, Navy personnel which is completely excluded from the memorial records. Um, some of whom may have died in Belgian waters, we haven't looked into that yet. And there are the unknowns, the untraceables, or uh, indeed uh, the ones who were omitted. Um, we know of one list that was omitted for sure. Uh, all the shot at dawns were left out after the war, out of the role of honours, uh, the official role of honours, so including also out of Ireland memorial records. And you see that from the 26 uh, Irish cases, 13 are linked with uh, the battlefields of uh, Flanders. So it's, it's, uh, it, you will not find them uh, in the memorial records, and yet there. Also here you see, for instance, uh, the, uh, the Canadian connection here. Wilson, he was uh, from Limerick. But also uh, very local boys, huh? Ulster, uh, the Belfast, with the street name, etc. Um, so, uh, names to add to get a better understanding. Um, if you look at this now in the historical perspective, it becomes more and more clear that all those names learn you also something about what happened in that war in Belgium. Um, who is Irish and in Belgium in 1914? Well, those are the Irish regiments uh, of whom the uh, regular battalions uh, were somewhere at mass, but then all of them were in First Ypres, and uh, almost 1,300 uh, died. The highest number of those uh, would be the Irish Guards, uh, and at that point that is uh, a complete Irish uh, uh, regiment. Uh, so apart from a number of the higher ranking officers, uh, who uh, may be uh, English, uh, all the others are uh, Irish, uh, for as far as we can see. In 1915, um, very important, uh, again, uh, the regular battalions of the Irish regiments, but also the reinforcements since um, the start of the war, already a lot of the uh, regiments needed uh, filling the gaps and during the, the second battle of Ypres uh, the casualty numbers were appalling also amongst uh, the Irish. 1916 as you know is uh, tr tragic for both the 16th and the 36th divisions uh, but that is especially uh, on the Somme and uh, so you see in Belgium the, the lowest number of uh, the whole war. Uh, they only arrive, I'll come to that uh, later, um, the Ulster Division at the end of July. Uh, and that is when they have to 
uh, uh, be taken out of the immediate action uh, after the first day on the Somme and uh, the Irish division after the battles of Guillemot and Grand Sheep. Come 1917, the year uh, that we are concerned with uh, this year, there's of course the Battle of Messines, the big mine battle, uh, which in fact I, I Messines uh, is in fact Weitschaten, as you know, or White Sheet, as they called it then. And uh, Langemark, which is in fact two small hamlets uh, for the 16th, it's Fresenburg, and for um, the 36th, it's Fortuyn, which is just uh, to the east of uh, St. Julian. Uh, but it's called the Battle of Langemark because uh, in battle nomenclature, you will, uh, some of you will uh, certainly know that, uh, you name the battle after where you made the largest progress, and that uh, was at Langemark, but not at Vresenberg and not at Fortuyn. And then in 1918, and then it's only the 36th Ulster Division remaining in Belgium um, during the spring offensive there, there, and during the final advance in Flanders, they are still there. In fact, the final uh, fighting of the Great War is the Battle of Courtrai uh, at the end of October 1918. And so in 1919, uh, there's a few of the uh, people who are still uh, in the battle who uh, died from their wounds uh, later on. So, what, when you then look at the, the two divisions separately, so they, uh, the 16th they arrive after Guillemot and Genshi, and they leave immediately after the Battle of Langemark, never to return again uh, to Belgium. It's not that they don't have uh, another role to play in, in the war, they do, and they remain on the Western Front, but it's all happening in uh, France. Uh, so you see 1737 uh, dead, and uh, when you compare that with the uh, Ulster Division, that's considerable less, because uh, they have more or less the same record for the remainder of 1916 and 1917, but then the 36th Ulster Division returns uh, during the second part of uh, the German Spring Offensive, the so-called Operation Georgette, uh, which is uh, uh, trying to, to uh, break through again uh, in the Valley of the Lys and then in the north at Ypres, and then again uh, from the end of September to the end of the war in the final advance in Flanders. And that means that, uh, of course, you will have another 900 fatalities in that final year of the war. Um, they operate in 1917 together, shoulder to shoulder, um, deliberately, uh, but you see they do that in exactly the same effort. When you compare uh, the dead figures, well, there's, there's nothing between them, as you can see. And uh, so, all the talking is about Messine. And there's hardly any talking for years and years and years uh, about uh, the Battle of Langemark. And you see that the big casualty uh, numbers are there. Um, also, that is quite traditional in the military memory. Uh, you talk about your victories more easily than you talk about the times when it uh, was much, much uh, worse uh, fighting. So, the overall Irish casualties of 1917 are much bigger. Um, they are almost 5,000. Uh, when you look at the whole campaign, which starts with the Battle of Messines and ends in Passchendaele, well, there's almost 5,000 uh, Irishmen uh, who uh, die in uh, Belgium. Um, when we now look, so this is the work we have uh, yesterday opened an exhibition and one of the things we've tried to do, and I think this is the first, uh, is try to point out 
Where exactly did, in all, the 170,000 people killed during that campaign of 1917, where exactly did they die? Uh, well, we have uh, divided up the whole, so there's two phases. One is the Battle of Messines, and the other one is called the Third Battle of Ypres or the Battle of Passchendaele, uh, because that is uh, the end there. And when we have divided up division by division, just now from the Allied side, and we're doing the same exercise uh, once we are happy enough with the casualty uh, figures from uh, the Germans, and then finally we're going to merge them, but that's going to be, I think, another two years before we, we're going to uh, get that result, but for this year we have this at least, in 288 different actions. So, per division, and uh, at certain periods and times uh, in uh, that summer and autumn of uh, 1917. Uh, and so the, the two Irish divisions are first deployed here at uh, Messina on the 7th of June. And uh, you see them there. And they are in the center of the attack. And they make the, the furthest progress. Four kilometers uh, progress to uh, the least casualties. It's amazing, and it is the flanks of, uh, on either side of the attack that suffered the most. Uh, in the North, 23rd and the 47th Divisions, in the South, the New Zealand Division and the Australian Division, the 3rd, and then uh, in a reinforcement of both the New Zealanders and the 3rd, the 4th Division. Almost 4,000 people killed. Uh, uh, during uh, the action of the of the 7th of uh, June, and you see uh, they're really standing out. The 36th and the 16th division in the center of the attack make the furthest progress for the least casualties. That is uh, uh, a conclusion that you can do from uh, this count and setting it out uh, in uh, the field and. Then we move on to the next, Third Battle of Ypres, where, uh, so there's only one date, 16th of August, but already we see that from the 2nd for the 16th and from the 5th for the 36th, they are operating, consolidating the line captured by the 15th and 55th divisions, uh, who are the uh, divisions that uh, have led the attack in the 19 core sector um, on the 31st of July. So, but very quickly after that, uh, they are called to help keep up the. Are called to help to uh, repair uh, roads, to do technical work, but also to help uh, to um, uh, reinforce uh, the. Uh, line that was captured um, on the first uh, day. And that is extremely costly, that is uh, not known, it's, it's uh, not a big fight, there's no big uh, battle name for it, but it costs a lot of men, so that you could say by the time they have to go into the attack, leading for the 19th Corps sector, uh, both uh, divisions are in fact already uh, well worn out before they start. Um, this is the so-called Battle of Langemark, and you see that in fact where they uh, have to start is not where uh, the line said that, uh, because that was somewhere here, that was the ground taken on the first, uh, on the 31st of July, and it's not there that they have to attack from, because that line is, is in counterattack by Germans, uh, partly uh, uh, fallen into German hands again, and it's from a, a, a point somewhere halfway between the original uh, uh, start of line and uh, the uh, line that was reached on the first day. So it's from here that they start, and this is the attack uh, they do. Uh, this is not the ground they're going to take, although they are supposed to do that. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, less. This is from the report 
from the 107th Brigade, uh, and so uh, they uh, can say the black line was reached uh, very much uh, at Fortin. So this is Saint Julien, and Fortin is just next to it. And then all along, this is the line that was captured when they were relieved on uh, the 17th uh, of August. Um, so very little progress was made, yet uh, the amount of casualties that fell uh, is staggering. And I show you what happened after that, because you see it's not uh, the, the uh, Supreme Commander of the 5th Army who was leading that campaign, uh, General Goff, uh, at some point said that he thought that the 16th was, was quite weak. And, and so he was not literally blaming them, but you could read his words as such. And that's not the case at all. Everybody is suffering, and I, I will explain you how that uh, how how you can understand that. It's uh, you can see what happens if if you compare all the actions all around, all through, and you see the dates. Nobody is moving. It's not the 36th, and it's not the 16th. It's everybody. And why is that? Well, here you have the first of the big streams that uh, at the the Zollebeek um, that runs through this valley, that's one reason. And beyond it is quite a steep slope. It's called Hill 35, and 35 is not the number, it's the altitude, it's 35 meters. So it's a hillock, it's nothing. Uh, but when you stand there in the in, in, in a, a, a valley of a little brook, of a little stream, which is swamped and which is uh, turned into a complete bog, then the slope all of a sudden becomes very high, very dramatic. And when that is manned with uh, German concrete bunkers who have all machine guns pointing at you, then of course it's a completely different matter. And it's going to uh, last until well beyond the 10th of September, so another month before they will reach uh, the ground. And it's only on the 20th of September that this line will give. And it's one of the most important, it's the Wilhelmstellung. It's the second of the great German uh, defense works. And their defense works very well at that point and at that stage uh, in the fight. So, but when you see uh, in all, in the whole period, uh, I said there was nothing between them. The two divisions suffer uh, throughout uh, the whole campaign. So the 31st of July, uh, the Third Battle of Ypres opens. It's the 55th that attacks here, the 15th mm -hmm. next to it, and they go into the attack. Mm -hmm. This is the, the, the ground that they supposedly cover on the first day, but as we have seen just they will have to, to retreat some. And in the meantime, the 36th uh, Ulster is also out there helping them out from the 5th onwards and for the 16th already from the uh, 31st uh, July onwards. And there they have already the, the, the almost the largest number of casualties uh, falls there. And then on the day itself, on the 16th, uh, you see uh, another uh, staggering number of dead uh, that are added. So that is um, it's very interesting to see what uh, the commander um, of the 36th Ulster Division, uh, Oliver Nugent, has to say about Langemak. Um, he uh, has has uh, corresponded with his wife. His Corresponded with his colleagues, and and uh, they are really a, a formidable read uh, to understand on um, what kind of conditions they had to uh, operate under, and and he is blaming himself in in a lot of ways, especially if you look at the at the at the 
uh, first quote, he says, we have failed all along the line. He thinks he, he, he is to blame. Uh, and then he changes his mind somewhat because he sees that it's, it cannot be his fault. It's, 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 the, it's the whole tragedy of that attack which uh, probably should not have happened. When we went into numbers available, it was realized how serious the losses had been. And I pointed out that if uh, was, uh, a new attack was underway, then it would be out of the question. Other divisions on my right and left all agreed as to their own men. It was not only the Ulster division which failed, but nearly all. It was machine guns which did, did us in. And the machine guns is indeed the machine guns in uh, uh, concrete uh, pillboxes and, and larger than pillboxes. Uh, this is the Wilhelmstellung which is holding out. And uh, if you just almost with bare hands have to go in it, very poor artillery support, then of course uh, failure is, is uh, certainly to come. <coughs> and then later on, he is part of, of, of those who will say, well, uh, Gough is a formidable man, he's a great guy, but he's not fit to actually command uh, this uh, big army. And uh, the final line, of course, is being uh, quoted uh, in, in other circumstances as well, that the number of the commanders on the Western Front, um, and that is not only for the British Army like that, it's also for the French Army, that a number of them come from the 1916 century traditions, and that they are in fact cavalry soldiers. That's where they learned the trade, and uh, uh, that they are not quite uh, up to um, the level of the war in 1917, uh, and uh, this is uh, the command that uh, So when you look now at that first phase, which is very, very uh, costly on the other side, just for this sector, you see there's almost 5,000 people killed. Um, if you look at the whole sector on the day, it's almost 10,000 people killed. Uh, and the, there's just one French division added to it, so uh, the overall casualty dead on the first day, on the 21st of July, is uh, 10,000. And then, uh, when you look at the Germans, it's only a quarter. Now, I said before, and I'm going to repeat it, that we are not sure yet of our German figures. Why is that? There's a very good reason for that. The reason is that you have uh, not a system of commemorating uh, individually the missing. That happened only in the Imperial, now Commonwealth War Graves Commission. The Belgians didn't do that, the French didn't do that, the Germans didn't do that. We have, for the casualties in Belgium, done this operation, the counting of all the missing and adding all the missing names for the Belgian army already, for the French army already, and we are doing it now for the Germans. But that is very difficult because the centralized data for that have disappeared. There have been, uh, archives have been bombed throughout the Second World War and a lot of the archives, especially those in Potsdam, have been hit and, and were lost. So you must do it on a very individual basis. What we do is we uh, try and lay hands on all the individual uh, roles of almost of all the regiments, but some regiments never published one, some regiments never made one up, etc., etc. So it's very difficult. From experience, we know now, um, as as we uh, that we may be wrong at the moment just in, in, in number-wise, uh, up to 25%. So, whenever we, we talk historically, and it may be an exaggeration, it's never going to be more, but it could be less. But, so we take the highest percentage to, to compare it in historical terms, and we are uh, seeing that at this first phase, so the Germans knew that this attack was coming, and in fact, they have handled this quite 
wisely, they've done quite well, they only have a quarter of the number of fatalities uh, in compared to the, the Allies. Now, one in three was generally accepted in the, in the First World War. Um, uh, the defender is always in a better position, uh, but here it is uh, staggering that um, it's, it's uh, more than one in three. Um, it gets better, and part of the, of the wearing and tearing of that Wilhelmstellung, of that second defense position, the one that you see here um, is done by the 36th standard and uh, 16th uh, uh, divisions. Uh, you can see the numbers here. And you see that the number is growing, and as it continues, that the number keeps growing. So this is very near the end of what is going to happen to uh, the Wilhelmstellung. This is their last stand, if you want, up to the 10th of uh, September. And after that, you're going to see with the Battle of the Menin Road, uh, again, not uh, talking about uh, Hill 35, that never gets a battle mention, uh, but the Menin Road, at that point, the Wilhelmstellung collapses. So we've done this for the whole uh, campaign, and, and uh, you see that uh, the final result is, is an incredible uh, slaughter. Uh, almost 170,000 uh, people killed during the summer and autumn of uh, 1917, of whom, amongst others, also over a thousand uh, civilians as collateral damage. Because the shelling, of course, is formidable. The preparation for all this is each time an artillery barrage, even far in the hinterland, so to prevent reserves to come up. And uh, this is happening in uh, areas which are still populated by Belgian civilians, and so uh, they suffer a great deal, as you can see. Um, you compare all these actions and, and how it stops at each time, you can lay over the map of the German defense and you understand better. The German defense is also always at the same position, just after a stream and on the slope uh, coming out of the valley. So uh, this is really a good understanding of uh, the terrain and also a uh, uh, great defense. It's only when they are really panicking, at some points they are panicking, and that they leave their very stubborn defense work and they are tempted to go into a counterattack with a lot of troops. Well, then you see that the, the casualty numbers uh, become higher. When we go then to the aerial photography, then uh, you see this is the area of the Wilhelmstellung, and this is from uh, the line taken by the Ulster Division. And you can see all of this is completely ruined. There's nothing left there. Uh, whereas, as you see here, uh, Passchendaele, you can still see the spire of the church. Um, and you can still see the woods and you can still see the hedges around the meadow. This is still a landscape, a recognizable landscape. This is turning into that big bog, that lunar landscape uh, from which we know uh, passionately. This is a photograph in August. Uh, the same here, but then from the perspective of uh, the 16th. And you see that's uh, the line of the, of the 16th. And again, Passchendaele uh, there and, and the other things. And, and you can see the same uh, features of an existing uh, Flemish landscape. Uh, a lot of uh, rows of tree, not a lot of woods, but the rows of tree to, to, to break up the western winds, of course, which are predominantly blowing through the plain. And then 
at this point here, uh, Del Vafa, just there, that is Hill 35. And that's where on the 10th of uh, September, the English poet, the Gloucestershire poet, Ivor Gurney, and composer, uh, is going to be gassed. Uh, he will survive, but uh, he will end up his life in a mental asylum. And, and uh, that's where the little monument is uh, since uh, a few years. It's, it must be now 15 years or so that the monument is there. And, and he wants to forget everything that connects him through this horrific uh, battle. Uh, and to my great uh, relief and, and uh, how can I say, uh, to, to, my, to my great surprise as well, the always forgotten battle is this year not going to be forgotten. This time uh, there will be a monument erected uh, just a few hundred meters back uh, and that is the stone that will have the monument. I don't know what it will look like. I'm not involved in, in erecting monuments um, and, and but I know that it will uh, go there and that's a few hundred meters uh, back from where the little monument to Ivor Gurney is standing. And it uh, is about here. So it is a, a slight uh, exaggeration. The line didn't get as far as that, but, but it, it will be there. Uh, I'm sure some of uh, the Elsa troops have been uh, that far and then having uh, to, to withdraw. So that's, that's where the monument is, is going to be. And which is an incredible uh, um, addition for understanding this. This is really a, 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 a missing Attention, link. please. No documents will be Thank issued God after 8.15pm. <laughs> it would be appreciated because what if had to be until now, are we had one to grave here as soon as and possible. five graves there. Thank you for your and that was it. On the actual battlefield where it all happened, we had six graves so far to tell you about this incredible <coughs> Irish contribution uh, to this horrific episode of the Third Battle of Ypres. At Bridge House Cemetery, here is the, the Fortin line, and so a few hundred meters back, you have the grave of uh, uh, Rifleman Baker of the Royal Irish Rifles, killed on the 16th of August 1917. And on the Sonnenbaker Road, so to the other end, uh, behind uh, the Irish division, which would be deployed somewhere there, uh, you have Airplane Cemetery, and this is a row where five of uh, uh, the casualties belong to the 16th division. And that was it until that time. So, uh, thank God there will be now an extra monument to uh, say, it wasn't just Messine, you know, in 1917, there was a lot more going on. Uh, this is looking at on the actual battlefield itself. This is where the monument is going to go. That's Pommern Castle. It, it's now a big uh, stables. There's a, there's a, a horse uh, stable there. And this is where the Ulster Division uh, was. And then it goes beyond. The, the farm, but I couldn't not show that, and that's where the Irish division uh, stood. And these are two of the big killers of the day, Beckhouse and Borry Farm, where you had all those bunkers with intact machine guns. There's another one further up uh, the slope. Uh, you have the, 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 the small river here, the Zonnebeek is there, and so beyond that you have halfway Iberian Farm, and that's the summit of Hill 35. So, if I would have told you, you would have just overlooked it. It's all the same Flanders Plain, but a small elevation like that, in conditions like that, can uh, make a big difference, as you can see. So, and then we come into commemoration. Another uh, Irish person killed already on the first day is uh, Francis Ledwich uh, from Slane in County Mead. Um, 
who got a similar uh, monument as uh, Ivor Gurney and uh, who will be commemorated also on the 31st of July. Um, another commemoration on an individual, we go back to the uh, Redmond of uh, the 1960s, that's how uh, the grave looks today. It's still the same cross, but the surroundings are uh, somewhat uh, changed. Uh, there was an annual walk there uh, on the morning of the 7th every year, and that is of course very much a, 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 a walk of the commemoration, because it's not just Redmond. You know, Redmond goes into the attack and he is wounded, and who finds him? Well, a stretcher bearer of the adjacent battalion, and that is a stretcher bearer, uh, Private John Meek of uh, uh, Derry Keen uh, in uh, uh, Ulster, in the Ulster Division. And you can see uh, last year we visited his grave with the, the friends of the museum, and the man that stands be, uh, with him is Bobby Forrest, one of the stonemasons who built the island of Ireland uh, Peace Park, you know, the Round Tower, which is the central piece of, of that uh, park. Uh, he was one of the um, uh, stonemasons uh, working at it. And the other person, you know, of course, uh, visited last year at the grave of Francis Ledwich, and again within a context of reconciliation, because Ledwich was also, uh, during a few months, um, uh, stationed at Ebrington Barracks in uh, London Derry, and so uh, uh, when Martin McGuinness uh, uh, visited, he had plans to do something there uh, in uh, Derry. I don't know what came of it. Uh, this is. Uh, last year before he uh, became ill. Um, but of course the big thing of course in Flanders now, and I said in the beginning, and, and I will end with that, that it's very much uh, not only important for the people in Ireland uh, to understand this in the right context, but for all the people throughout Europe. Uh, it helps us understand how this uh, terrible uh, World War, in fact, was very much also a European war, um, and and that uh, coming to terms with our history is for all of us equally um, important. Uh, I visited in all kinds of weather, as you can see, <laughs> and of course I go there also with school groups, and not only me, I do one or two school groups per year just to stay in touch, I don't have the time for that, but our educational people go a lot there, also with not Irish groups, because of course that is an important text for everyone, uh, that peace pledge of saying, look, we must come to terms and understand each other, and understand and use our history in the right way. And of course this is always the great, the great thing, the, the, the stone at, at the back with all the names of the counties, which of course you cannot read unless you know them. And that of course is, uh, that's the great thing. If, if you don't know each other, you cannot understand each other. That's, so I think it's very cleverly done. Another guy who, who uh, is not featured in the memorial is because he immigrated to, to uh, Canada, was a bit of a, of a, of a, a sports hero. He was a, a Boston Marathon uh, winner, and then he died during the Second Battle of Ypres uh, in one of the first gas attacks of uh, the war. Um, what is still uh, to be done for us in the next few years, uh, because everybody's always talking about 1917 Island Messines, that's all very fine and dandy, but there is also 1918 and the Ulster Division. And then uh, uh, we have to study this battle more carefully because, you know, uh, with all the effort that was taken to go all the way to Passchendaele, a year later they withdrew in two days 
And then they called on the Irish again, on the 36th Ulster Division again, to keep the stand there. And uh, Nugent was very uh, outspoken about it. Here I am back in this filthy Ypres sector, in the very place where I had my headquarters at the time I left to command this division. Somewhat altered and enlarged, and there are huts now, but I still live and work in the dugouts in the canal bank, where he was on the 16th of August. Uh, 1917. So the story just continues, and it continues in um, the final advance. Um, and as you can see here, this is the first time that uh, the 36th is standing next to the Belgian army. So we haven't looked into any of the connections there, any of the liaisons there. So maybe there's an, a, a few more interesting stories to, to, to get there. And the same here, of course, they are not in the, on the opening day, they are in reserve, but they are again next to the Belgians. And that is again, so when they come then into uh, the, the line. But again, almost 400 fatalities in the first episode, another 400 uh, in the final episode, uh, which is the Battle of Courtrai. Uh, after that, uh, the war is over for the Ulster Division. Um, Armistice Day, they are here in Mouscroon, as they say in French, or Moucron uh, in France. And uh, that is something that we still have uh, to research uh, before the end uh, of uh, next year. So, um, there's a lot of, of uh, stories attached to this, uh, stories that uh, keep inspiring people to this uh, day. And my final slide, therefore, is one by a present day uh, Belfast writer, uh, the great Michael Lombardy, who is the son of a veteran of the Battle of Messine, um, also of uh, the London Scottish, but then later on a sergeant in the 22nd London Regiment, the 47th Division. Imagine among those meadows where the soldiers sink to dust, an aftermath with swallows lifting blood on their breasts up to the homely gables, and like a dark cross, overhead the hawk. Thank you. Thank you.